Hello, hello everybody. So let's uh, let's just start with this first uh, quantum Spain colloquia. Uh, let me briefly explain what is quantum Spain first, and then I, I will just uh, introduce our uh, uh, speaker. So quantum Spain is a project that is uh, is led by the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and it goes to the Spanish Supercomputing Network, and it's about creating ecosystem around quantum computation. So we will acquire a quantum computer that will be installed here at, at BSC. But the project is about creating ecosystem. So basically, we want more people working on quantum computing. We want to teach quantum computing to different, uh, different people with different backgrounds, not only physics or computer science, also uh, finance, uh, biology, um, artificial intelligence, etc. And that's what this quantum is been about. And in that direction, we expect to continue organizing this kind of events here in Barcelona and also in other parts of Spain, because in the end, this is a big project that involves, uh, at the moment, 30 centers, and, uh, and in the coming uh, months, probably much more people. So let me introduce uh, Sergio Bosho from uh, Google Quantum AI. Sergio uh, is from Spain. He's from Leon. He studied um, the computer science um, degree in university in Madrid. And after that, he also studied uh, um, philosophy and mathematics at UNET. And he moved to Barcelona one year to, to, to pursue a master in physics. And after that, he worked on uh, the Central European Bank. Then he moved to the other side of the Atlantic. He moved to the United States. And he was in New Mexico University, in Harvard, and finally to the University of Santa Barbara, where he joined uh, the, quantum, uh, the Google quantum effort that was, uh, that was rising there. So uh, without further ado, let me, let's welcome Sergio Bosho to, to Barcelona. And he will talk about the beyond classical computation from a computer science perspective. Thank you. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? I guess so. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for coming uh, in the end of June at 4 p.m. Uh, I'll try not to sleep already. Is this coupling? Ooh. Is that on? Okay, I think we're good. All right, yeah, so um, uh, first let me acknowledge uh, some of the people at Google. This is uh, actually pre-COVID, so the, the group is bigger now. But I'm gonna talk about the stuff from uh, the, the group at Quantum AI at Google, and uh, you know, I'm very lucky to have a lot of uh, very talented colleagues and a lot of the work I'm going to present is actually not my work, but their work. Um, great. So I'll start with a quick introduction to quantum computing, just to give a, a little bit of a flavor of what quantum computing is about. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to explain quickly uh, what is called the double slit experiment. So. The way this experiment works is you can have a wall with two slits, and then you can throw electrons or photons or whatever um, against this wall, and some electrons will go through one slit or the other slit uh, instead of just crossing in the wall. So what you will expect, because electrons are particles, is that when electrons go through the left, they will have a bump on the left because they are going through this left this path. And if they go through the right, they will form like a right bump where electrons collide. And what you see is that even if you throw electrons one at a time, uh, you actually see many different bumps in this wall instead of just two. So the way you have to explain that, and by the way, this is actually images of an experiment from 1999. So you can see this is actually true. You, you are throwing the electrons. And at the beginning, you just see some scattered dots where the electrons are collided. And they look like particles, because electrons are particles. But as you start um, recording the collisions of more and more electrons, eventually, you actually do see these many bumps, instead of just two, because you have two slits, you will expect. Two bumps, you see many of them. So this is called a diffraction pattern. And the way you explain it is you have to think of electrons not as a particle, which they are particles. They look perfectly like particles at the beginning. 
you have to think of them as waves. And if it is a wave, then you can clearly explain how this happens because a wave can go through both slits at the same time. And then it will form interference, like in a, in a bathtub or the pool or something. If you splash the water, there will be waves, and there will be places where um, waves, a lo mejor, if you splash with two hands, they will sort of add up, and you will have a bigger wave in the middle, right? So the, um, so the conclusion of this experiment is that electrons are not only particles, which again, they do behave like particles once you measure them, once you see they collide in only one point, but they actually behave like waves and go through both slits at the same time. Now, there is no, you know, a very, I mean, there is not a classical way to understand this. This is just quantum mechanics. And it just happens that electrons behave that way. They will go through both paths. And one consequence of that is if you want to describe an electron, well, it turns out to be convenient to describe electrons not just as real numbers, like the position maybe going from the left and going from the right, but you describe them with amplitude and phase as, as you would describe electromagnetic waves. Uh, because there are waves as well. And the most convenient way to describe waves is with a phase. A wave has a phase, it can be up, like, you know, like a sine or a cosine, that's the phase, right? And normally that means that to describe the phase and the amplitude, you describe electrons with complex numbers. Okay, so one conclusion of this experiment is that if you're a physicist describing how electrons behave, you're forced to describe the position and momentum of the electron using complex numbers, which is strange, not just real numbers, but imaginary numbers. And another thing that is interesting is that, in some sense, the electrons is actually going through both paths at the same time, and this is the principle of superposition. And part of the idea of quantum computing is actually take advantage of this path. If these two paths, you think of them as two parallel computations, then in some sense, electrons are actually doing both computations at the same time. Uh, now the key is, well, to sort of try to get both computations to interfere, as waves do, but now you're interfering computations until you actually measure them. When you measure, you actually collapse the computation, and you will get one result. Okay, so this is a quick overview of what's going on in quantum physics. And again, we're going to need, uh, because electrons and, in general, you know, quantum systems are both particle and waves, you need complex numbers to describe them. And they can do more than one thing at the same time, as a wave will do, until you measure them. All right. So that's a quick introduction to quantum computing. Now, if we want to do computation with this, like thinking of the two different paths uh, that the electron can take as different computations, then what you do is you try to encode paths uh, as computations. You will want to use gates, like you would use gates in a classical circuit. So here in the left is, um, well, a, a representation of a classical gate, if you want. This is a, a stochastic matrix, if you have a probabilistic gate. And you could do all classical computation, put it together, little, you know, many gates in a circuit. And you could do your gates, if they are probabilistic, as matrices like this. And the key here, let's say the numbers on the top, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, this bit pairs of bits, they are the input, and this is the output. So this tells you that with probability 1 half, this is a probability, 0, 0 maps to 0, 1, and with probability 1 half maps to 1, 1. So if you're doing classical computation with a probabilistic gates, then you have to use positive real numbers, because these are probabilities, and they add to 1. Now, if you want to do quantum gates, and this is how you represent a circuit with quantum gates, if you're familiar with classical circuits, it's inspired by classical circuits, but the symbols for the gates are different. The difference between a quantum gate and a classical gate is that, as I was trying to motivate, um, if you want to describe quantum systems, you need complex numbers. So we're going to take the concept of a stochastic matrix, and we're going to put imaginary, imaginary numbers in the middle, like this one. So these are not probabilities anymore. It doesn't make sense of probabilities. They can be negative numbers. Probabilities cannot be negative, and they can be imaginary numbers because you're sort of encoding the phase of a wave. And the rules now is that this is a unitary matrix, which means that if you conjugate it and multiply it by itself, you get the identity, sort of to conserve probability you want. It's the equivalent of conserving probability. So um, the 
idea of this slide is to motivate how people think about doing quantum algorithms. Uh, different things how you actually build a quantum computer, but if you want to think about how, you know, how people think about uh, quantum algorithms, the idea is instead of classical gates that you put together, you have quantum gates, and any uh, unitary matrix is a valid quantum gates. And there's you know, theories about like some small set of gates or universals and stuff like that. So in a sense, you know, it's inspired from the idea of doing classical computation but putting complex numbers in the middle. And it turns out that if you put complex numbers, then uh, sometimes you can do more powerful things uh, that you cannot do without complex numbers. So people eventually found out, surprisingly, that by doing computations with unitary matrices, there are some computations that we believe cannot be done classically that is with stochastic, stochastic matrices that you can actually do efficiently uh, if you allow your gates to have complex numbers. OK, so this is a very broad overview just to motivate quantum computing. Just instead of a stochastic metrics, use unitary metrics with complex numbers. Of course, it takes a while to get used to this and to learn to program with complex unitary metrics. You know, it takes a while with classical gates as well. So it takes a bit longer with complex numbers. Uh, but it's becoming a bit more uh, mainstream, I guess. There is you know, more interest in quantum computing. So at Google, which is where I work, uh, we have a website with education tools, and there are tutorials. Uh, so you can just go here. It's all open source. And then you can run these tutorials. You can actually run in Colab, which means you just click, and it will open in your browser like a Python Colab. And you can just run through the tutorial if you want to you know, like program a little bit a small quantum algorithms. There are tools here for education that you can use. OK, so that's just some motivation of what quantum computing looks like and what's the inspiration. But then, of course, the reason why this is you know, super interesting, in my view, is that this is not only you know, a mathematical model that you know, it will be interesting, actually, as a mathematical model. Let's see what happens if I use, instead of a stochastic matrices, unitary matrices for computation. It's an interesting computational paradigm. Uh, but the really interesting thing is you can actually build computers that actually have gates that behave with complex numbers, because you actually can compute with quantum systems. So right now, what we have are prototypes of quantum computers. I wouldn't really call them computers, because they crash very quickly. They are more like physics experiments. And they kind of look like this. This is, well, with superconductors, which is what we use at Google. And as you can tell, well, it just looks you know, like an experiment, which it is. Uh, all the stuff you have out here, those are FPGAs to program the computation. So there's going to be a chip in the middle here, which is the quantum chip. All this stuff is the operating system, if you want, and the program. And it's, in our case, it's done with FPGAs. And all these cables are the control cables, so we can control this superconducting chip to do computations. If we didn't have all this control, then it wouldn't be a computer. So the difference between you know, these noisy experimental quantum computers and more traditional physics experiments, I will argue, is the precise control that we have. Right? So we spend a lot of effort and time building on this machinery and putting all these cables because we're controlling every qubit. A qubit is the quantum version of a bit, these complex numbers. Uh, we can program them with these gates with complex numbers. And to be able to program every one of them, we need all this machinery around. And that's why we use superconducting qubits, which are sort of artificial atoms, because you know, they're really good natural atoms that work very well quantum mechanically, but they are harder to control because atoms are very tiny. So instead of using atoms, we do all this complicated stuff. This is a dilution refrigerator. Well, different stages of the dilution refrigerator. There will be a chip here with all these cables to program it, and the chip kind of looks like this. And that's really uh, where we have our superconducting qubits, which are superconducting circuits, and they work as artificial atoms. They are so called that at 20 millikelvin, which is like uh, 30 times colder than empty space. And the reason why they are so called is because we want them to work like quantum atoms, that means we want the energy to be quantized. Like in an atom, there is energy 0, energy 1. Um, that's where quantum mechanics from, come from, quantization of the energy levels. So these superconducting circuits, they work as artificial atoms because energy levels are quantized at this very low temperature with very low noise. So we have one processor that we put at the bottom here, all these wires that I was showing you before, and a lot of complicated stuff 
which has to do you know, amplifiers, attenuators, wiring, control hardware, because this is a computer, a prototype of a computer, not just a physics experiment. OK, so um, this is sort of where we are, more or less. Uh, you, know, you see here like a representation of the quantum chip with all these cables getting there. I'm going to talk about uh, stuff that has been going on since 2019, meaning, well, what I call beyond classical, people call it quantum advantage or uh, quantum supremacy, things like that. What it means is, arguably, and this is what we're going to talk about, we enter now an era where for some very specific calculations, um, there is a competition, there is a race between these experimental processors, even though they're in their infancy, are um, the biggest supercomputers, like the one we have there in the little church. <laughs> uh, for some very specific computations. Uh, for almost everything, supercomputers are faster, but it's interesting, I think, that even though this is very experimental, uh, it can compete you know, with uh, a, a computer that takes the size of a building and needs its own power station. Uh, but this is just the beginning. Uh, eventually, our end goal is like in around 2029, more or less, uh, to build a full-tolerant quantum computer, which means you know, it, this is a representation of how it might look like. It will have a lot more qubits. Most of the qubits will actually be doing error correction. And the reason is that the computations here, they last for like a microsecond, one millionth of a second, before the quantum computation crashes, because there are errors because quantum systems are super sensitive. They collapse like an electron when you measure it, then it's a particle, not a wave. So any sort of interaction with the environment collapses the computation. And in superconducting qubits, they last for a microsecond. We can only do very short computations right now. So to be able to do computations as you will expect with a computer, meaning you program it as you will a normal computer, and then you, know, you actually run the program, and it actually works until you switch it off, you know, not just a microsecond. We need, we're going to need this very complicated device, which is mostly going to be doing error correction. And most of the milestones in our way there have to do with actually building the error correction machinery. 99% of the stuff here is just going to be doing error correction, so computations last longer. And this will be a proper computer, right, where you can actually give a manual to, you know, a computer engineer, and they can read the, pro the manual, and then they just go and program it. Now it's like a physics experiment. Uh, we actually do a lot of physics experiments in between, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, but you know, from here to here, it's not like we're just going to be doing error correction and nothing else. We actually, you know, this is a super controllable quantum system, so there's a lot of interesting quantum physics and quantum experiments that you can do today. So arguably, there are applications already. So. Um, um, we're in this era that we call noisy intermediate scale quantum, meaning, well, again, these are prototypes. They're noisy, computations last for a microsecond, so it's not normal computers. But I argue that uh, even though you cannot just program them, uh, you know, they, they crash in a microsecond, there are still many interesting physics experiments that you can do. I'm going to talk about experiments having to do with random circuits. I'm not going to describe things related to quantum gravity and more physics, things like that. Uh, it's possible that before we have the fault around quantum computer, we can actually do simulations of chemistry and physics. This is sort of the holy grail of quantum computing. It's kind of, I think, the main reason, I will argue, why we're building quantum computers, because we could simulate you know, a lot of physics and chemistry. Right now, we can simulate a tiny corner. Even you know, if we use the Majorostrum, we can simulate only a tiny corner of physics and chemistry. You will run things like DFT and approximations like that. Will this? With a proper full-time quantum computer, you could do, you know, proper um, chemistry simulations. It's unclear if we're going to be able to do actual applications simulation, simulating chemistry because uh, it's problematic to sort of encode fermions in qubits for reasons I won't get into. But you know, I'm casually optimistic that maybe we can do this before we have a full-time quantum computer. I'm very optimistic we're going to be able to do simulations with fermions in 10 years. And then uh, there is an area, well, we would love to do classical machine learning and classical optimization because uh, you know, there are many applications having to do with classical machine learning and classical optimization. I am, you know, let's say, more pessimistic that we're going to be able to do this without a fault on quantum computer. 
mostly because, well, in these cases, you arguably have exponential quantum speed ups. You know, the idea that we're doing these quantum gates with complex numbers allows us to do algorith algorithms that are exponentially faster for these applications than classical algorithms. We don't know that we can do classical machine learning and classical optimization exponentially faster with a quantum computer, even a full time quantum computer. And classical machines are pretty amazing, so it's super hard to compete with, you know, Mario Nostrum for classical machine learning with an experimental prototype. So I'm not optimistic that you know, we're going to be able to see applications before we have a full time quantum computer in machine learning. But I'm optimistic about spin models and physics experiments in general. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, not quite an application yet, but the flavor, I guess, of uh, you know, getting to an application, which is what, we're, what I call these beyond classical experiments. Some people call it quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. And what it means, if you want, is kind of like the top 500 between quantum computers and classical computers, where we choose a problem, which is actually, um, we choose a problem that, in principle, the quantum computer can do better. Because again, most problems, the classical computer will do better. That's not interesting. Like if we try to do arithmetic, you know, classical computer does better. I already know that. So what is, I think, interesting is if we can compete with these experimental devices against a supercomputer. That's interesting, right? That's surprising. Um, again, the, the explanation will be then that we actually have an exponential speed up because we're using these complex gates, at least in one problem. So um, there, are, um, there are these experiments that have been, happened, have been going on since 2019, our first experiment, and a couple of experiments from China following our experiment and actually a very similar sort of architecture and design. Uh, which have, are called random circuit sampling, so I will explain that. And there are other more recent experiments, two from China, one from Canada, uh, having to do with Gaussian boson sampling. So I'm going to talk about these experiments. And if you want sort of the benchmark, the top 500 between experimental processors and supercomputers and where we are. And I think, again, it's interesting that at least in some problems, it makes sense to talk about a race between a cheap and a computer of the size of a building because there is an exponential speed up. So I will start with um, random circuit sampling. So what is random circuit sampling? Well, this is a computational task which consists of the following. You start with a random quantum circuit. So a random quantum circuit, this is again like a representation of a quantum circuit. Looks like a classical circuit, but now the gates, these quantum gates here, instead of being a stochastic gates, with real numbers, they are or positive numbers. They are actually uh, quantum gates, so they can have complex numbers. But it is a, a circuit, so we're going to choose the gates at random. But once we choose them, then we know what the circuit is, right? So we have a, you know, everybody knows like that's the task, the computational task is here. It's a, it's a circuit which I chose at random, so it doesn't have symmetries, and you cannot take circuits to simulate. Um, it's chosen at random, but it's a perfectly well-defined circuit, and I can write it in a piece of paper. And the, the computational task is to basically run the quantum circuit. So when you run a circuit, a quantum circuit, again, it looks like a stochastic computer. And you remember, like the electron, there are, you know, there are probabilities that will go in one bump or another because the interference and quantum mechanics is probabilistic. So the outcome of a random circuit is probabilistic. So that means that the quantum circuit defines a probability distribution. Every quantum circuit defines a very specific probability distribution. It's like a, it's like a stochastic classical algorithm will define a probabilistic distribution, the outcome of that stochastic classical algorithm, the same um, you know, a fortiori uh, with a quantum circuit. So the computational task is given this quantum circuit sample the output of the quantum circuit. And now we're going to do this. Um, you know, top 500 benchmark where we run the quantum circuit in our experimental quantum processor. And we um, run it against the best classical algorithms that we know of in a supercomputer. And then we try to see which one is faster. And if it becomes sort of unfeasible in practice in a supercomputer, then we declare like we move beyond what you can do classically because we have an exponential speed up. So this is sort of the idea that um, I proposed in 2016 for a first demonstration of you know, a experimental quantum processor outperforming a supercomputer. OK, so what happens is um, this is experimental data from 2019. Um, 
this is only with 12 qubits. 12 qubits you can simulate. So the cost of doing the simulations of these algorithms, what is interesting, is exponential, sort of in the number of qubits and the depth of the circuit. And I will talk a bit about the best classical algorithms to simulate this computational task, which is something actually that people here in the supercomputing center work on, the same algorithms. Um, so 12 qubits, not hard to do because you know 2 to the 12 is 4,000. So small number, no problem simulating circuits with 12 qubits. Blue is um, the ideal distribution, like what you will expect if you run the quantum circuit in a perfectly working, no errors quantum computer, which we don't have. So you will expect to get this distribution, the blue dots. These are like just the beta strings order, you know, from zero to 4,000 something. And this will be a high probability beta string, and this will be like a low probability beta string. So we can just simulate the circuit, we get all the probabilities. When we run in an experimental quantum processor, there is noise, they will, they will crash once in a while. When it crashes, it gives me something that is not the ideal outcome. So what you get is sort of the orange distribution, which is you know, not as high as the blue, because once in a while, when, when you were supposed to measure this, actually it crashes, and then you measure something completely unrelated. So it sort of flattens the distribution, but you know, you, it kind of has the same peaks, right? The peaks in the same places. They are lower because of the noise, but you can tell that it's following the same topography if you want. So we can um, use that to sort of check if I'm doing my computation approximately. I'm not gonna be doing it exactly because it's gonna cross, I know that, but approximately. Okay, so how I do that? Well, this, um, we introduce this measure that we call, well, it's actually inspired by cross-entropy as used in machine learning, we call it linear cross-entropy. So the computational task is sampling from some ideal, well, we cannot sample from the ideal distribution. These are the ideal probabilities for beta string S. But because there is noise, we actually have a distribution which is a mixture, right? With some probability, there is an error, with probability, F is the fidelity, the probability of no error. So with probability no error, we actually sample from the ideal distribution. But uh, with probability one minus fidelity, there is an error, and then we sample from something which is just noise. I don't know what it is. Uh, but I know that it's kind of flat and unrelated, uncorrelated to the ideal distribution. So then I'm gonna be, the, the actual computational task is to sample from this statistical mixture, like the mixture of the two distributions, the ideal one and the noisy one. And there is this very important parameter, which is the fidelity, which is the probability that there are errors. And the, the trick is, well, if there are too many errors, you just get noise, so that's very easy to simulate classically because it's just random bit of strings. So the key is you try to, you, you have to make sure that your quantum computer is good enough that you have like a non-trivial fidelity that makes it hard for classical algorithms. So it turns out, for reasons that I'm not gonna get into, that you can estimate this parameter, which is called the fidelity, the probability of not having an error, which if you want is also a benchmark about how noisy your computer is, which is right now the hardest part if quantum computers, making them less noisy. Uh, so you can estimate this parameter, the probability of an error, with this very simple equation. You, you just sample bit strings experimentally, those are my S, and I average, the ideal probability, so I need to do a simulation. This is a catch-22 situation where I actually need to do the ideal simulation to know what are the ideal probabilities, but if I average the ideal probabilities and I normalize them with two to the number of qubits, this is this two to the number of qubits minus one, turns out that this actually gives you this fidelity, F, under very general assumptions about the noise. So the point of the, of the computational task is, well, to sample with this distribution, you can run an estimator of this fidelity, and then you can check if I'm actually sampling from a non-trivial mixture. Now, um, this is a computational task. This is not, I wouldn't say this is like an MP problem where you just pass this equation and then you're done, because again, the computational task is to sample, not just to pass a test. Um, so then you actually do other estimators of the fidelity, and then you check that they coincide, and it gets complicated. You do a statistical test in general to check that you're sampling from this distribution. This is one of the most important ones, but you have to do others. Anyway, so that's what we did in 2019. And then um, for the hardest circuits that we run with the best algorithms known at the time, and I'm gonna talk in a second about how algorithms have progressed, classical algorithms have progressed a lot, but anyway, with the best algorithms at the time, our estimation is that it will take like 10,000 years uh, with a supercomputer to obtain a similar sampling from the one that we did experimentally. Two years later, uh, you know, a, a well-funded group in China using a very similar design, they sort of implemented the experiment. So it's good because you know, science is supposed to be, um, you can replicate experiments in science. So they did, they replicated the experiment. 
uh, so things are working well. And they actually have more qubits. This experiment is actually harder than this experiment because they have a few more qubits, and actually the shortcut layout is more regular. OK, so I, I said like in the, at the time, the best algorithms were 10,000 years. Um, but algorithms have made a lot of progress. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the best algorithms to simulate these kind of quantum noisy circuits today. And again, it's in, you know, people in, in this center, in the Barcelona Super Computing Center, work in these algorithms as well. So this is my quantum circuit again, uh, where these boxes are my gates. And I can think of my gates there, these matrices, right? So matrices are tensors, meaning they have indexes for input, the input of the matrix, indexes for output. And it turns out that the uh, execution of a circuit measuring a bit string is sort of, well, is what is called a tensor contraction. You just multiply all these matrices together. One, one of these matrices will be like the you know, unitary matrix as I had at the beginning with some complex numbers inside. And all you have to do is, I already, you know, in this experiment, these gates are chosen at random, but they're perfectly clear what the gates are. So you just have to multiply all these gates, multiply all these tensors um, um, with tensor contraction, meaning, well, you know, the qubit goes from here to here. So that means you have to sort of sum over the corresponding index, like the index of this matrix sums with the index of this matrix here. So this operation is called a tensor contraction. So you can represent the quantum circuit as what is called a tensor network, just a bunch of multiplications of matrices. That's called a tensor network because they can have more than two indexes or four indexes. And, and as you multiply them, the number of indexes in the tensor grows, the rank of the tensor grows. But if you just do this stuff, that's a perfectly, well, you know, perfect simulation of the computational task. So the complication, of course, is that multiplying all these tensors becomes exponentially hard because as you sum stuff, you're putting tensors together, and the rank of the tensor grows, and the cost is exponential on the rank. And it turns out that the order in which you choose these multiplications has a dramatic effect in the computational cost. So you have to be quite smart in how you, what indexes you sum first in these tensor network operations. Anyway, so we did the sort of first application of tensor networks to quantum circuits, I think, uh, using an algorithm. These algorithms happen all the time. Uh, it's also known in machine learning like buckets algorithm or excitability propagation. Physicists call it tensor networks or Feynman algorithm. Um, the reason why we were, were benchmarking this algorithm uh, before we did our experiment is because we knew we could have you know, 50 something qubits, which are in principle too many to actually fit in the RAM of a supercomputer. But um, this tensor network operation, well, you can do, like, even in 2017, we were doing, like, a 10 by 10, so 100 qubits, as long as the depth is not very large, because it kind of looks like, like a most abstract operation. It's not exponential only in the number of qubits. It's sort of exponential in the computational volume. So that's why we implemented this algorithm, to make sure that we only have not, we had not only enough qubits, but also enough depth. Uh, but we didn't know really how to choose a good contraction ordering. And I was telling you the contraction ordering, so the, what indexes the order in which you sum the indexes in the contraction has a dramatic and exponential um, cost uh, in the computational cost of the algorithm. So we didn't really know how to do that. We just went to some algorithm that, that is online because this problem of how to choose good contraction orderings you know, happens in computer science. And we found QuickBB, which is just a heuristic that somebody from computer engineering had published, and that's what we used at the time. So what happened, well, this is sort of an explanation of why the contraction ordering is important. But in the interest of time, just believe me, uh, what really happened in between is that, um, uh, well, Johnny Gray and, and Curtis, they actually found out their physicists. Well, Curtis, I'm not sure, Johnny Gray, for sure. Uh, they work in tensor networks, uh, and they found out a much optimized way to do this contraction ordering. So that's kind of interesting because here is, you know, like a, a, a sort of quantum circuit problem. Then we use this algorithm, which is used in machine learning quite a lot, if you want, buckets algorithm, and it's certainly used in physics a lot as tensor networks. It wasn't really know how to use, choose a good contraction ordering. Uh, the people in computer engineering had worked on that, and that's why they had like this quick BB and other algorithms. But anyway, using community detection, which is, again, a technique sort of from you know, graph theory and machine learning, um, they they, 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 the basic idea is that um, 
The tensors, you can represent them as vertices in the graph, as I did for the quantum circuit, with the indexes. You know, it was like the qubits, so there are the indices that multiply tensors. So what you want to do is, the, if there are many tensors that sort of have many indexes between them, they kind of form a community, and you want to contrast them together, right? Because when you, the cost, again, is exponential in the number of indexes that you leave around. So if you contrast this whole thing, there are a few indexes going outside of this community. So this is good. I contrast all this stuff, and I have only four, five indexes left. Whereas if I try to contract, you know, all the way like in the middle around here, then I will have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, blah, blah, blah. So I leave many indexes open, and that and the cost is exponential in the number of indexes that I leave open. So they use these algorithms from community detection, from you know, um, computer engineering uh, algorithms that are out there. They didn't implement the community detection algorithms themselves. And they just find these communities, meaning tensors that have a lot of indices in common. And this is pretty optimal, actually. We have studied this ourselves quite a bit as well. And we actually were able to improve a little bit over this. But anyway, this is sort of a pretty optimal contraction or anything. So I think that's interesting that I will argue, well, for certain sizes, this one scales for super big tensor networks. But for much bigger tensor networks than before, we seem to be finding almost optimal contraction orderings, and that has applications in machine learning and other areas of physics. OK, so that's sort of where we are. Oh, and I should mention the 10,000 years with this and many other tricks has now become like 15 hours and five, you know, running on 512 GPUs. This is sort of the latest benchmark. Um, mostly because of this, because you know, quick BB is like here, I guess. And Hyperpar is an algorithm for community detection. So you see there are many orders of magnitude. <laughs> right, if you choose a good contraction order, then this is a log scale. So the cost decreases by many orders of magnitude. And with this and many other tricks that I'm going to get into, like now we're pretty good at distributed tensor network computations, which is actually you know, something that Arturo does, <laughs> distributed tensor network computations. Um, so with uh, improvements like that, um, it, it went down to 15 hours with 512 GPUs. OK, so that's um, one sort of billion classical algorithm and the latest benchmarks. Uh, I don't have the timings for the, the latest tensor networks on the sort of bigger, more symmetric uh, USTC Chinese experiment, but it will be you know, bigger. It wouldn't be, I don't know if, if it can be done. And anyway, so we can you know, run in a bigger chip. Um, it's exponential, so OK, so they catch up with us. If we put a few more qubits, they don't anymore. It doesn't anymore. I want to talk about another very interesting proposal to sort of do this benchmark against you know, quantum prototypes against classical supercomputers. It's called Gaussian Boson Sampling. It's a more um, experimental friendly version of what is called Boson Sampling, which is a proposal by Scott Aronson. And I'm just going to sort of try to give, again, a, a brief overview of what this thing does. Well, this is um, another Chinese experiment, also from USTC. Again, this you know, group have good funding and good people. Um, China is really you know, investing heavily in quantum computing. So this is very different. It's not the supercomputing random circuits. This is a photonic um, sort of processor. This one doesn't look as much as a computer to me. You remember the supercomputer processor had all these cables, had all this control. You have like perfect control over the operations. Here, the computation is basically there is a crystal somewhere in the middle. And then the, whatever diffraction you get in the crystal, that's your computation. If you want a different computation, you get a different crystal, and you kind of get what you get. So it's not programmable. I don't know if this is so much an experiment. All this stuff around are just interference paths for the many sort of optical paths, because you want to get a lot of interference. But you don't really have programmability in this particular experiment. But anyway, um, turns out that you know, once you fabricate the crystal, you can measure it, and you sort of see what are the diffraction patterns in the crystal. And then it's still a very hard computational task, even though it's not quite programmable, but it's not programmable. It's, it's still a hard computational task, like you know, what sampling do I get out of this particular crystal once after I measure it? So that's still a very interesting experiment. Uh, and you have the modes here, are sort of the equivalent of qubits. So if you want, it's like 144 modes or qubits. And, and that's sort of the, the question. You know, uh, what you, you do the experiment, you, you do something similar to our linear cross entropy, actually, they, they, you do that. And then you see if you sample better than a classical algorithm. So again, this top 500 competition. OK, so um, well, it turns out. If you try to do this with sort of the algorithms that were known when they 
first we're working on this experiment. Like, if you try to do this ideally, then you have no chance because uh, it's just exponentially hard and blah, blah, blah. No way you can try to mimic that sample with an ideally, with an ideal algorithm. But again, this experiment also has a lot of noise and imperfections. So the question is, what about approximate algorithms? Well, it turns out that for random sampling, for reasons that I'm going to get into, approximations break down. So you kind of have to do this tensor network. You can put some approximations, but it's limited. Um, after the you know, USTC experiment, we actually worked on this, and we were able to find an interesting classical approximation to this boson sampling problem that I'm going to try to give you the flavor of. So it's a sampling problem. They have this interferometer. It's just the crystal in the middle with a bunch of modes coming in. It's 50, but then it splits into 144. And then you have the detectors. And when you have the detectors, well, then you measure bit streams, right? And you measure some bit stream, then you measure another, then you measure another. And the question is sort of try to approximate the probability distribution that you get from the detectors. And you want to approximate it better with a classical computer than with the experiment itself. So we're going to talk about um, three probability distributions. There is Q, which is the ideal distribution, PE, which is the experimental output, and PM, which is the classical mock-up. This is just an algorithm that I'm going to make up, uh, which is going to try to approximate the ideal distribution better than the experimental output approximates the ideal distribution. So it's just a classical mock-up. And in contrast with the tensor network algorithms, which have improved a lot with the concept of the contraction or any other stuff, they are still exponential. This is um, polynomial. So we were able to do something quite interesting. Uh, but, you know, and I think, again, this has applications, not just to boson sampling, but it's kind of an interesting classical algorithm for interesting you know, classical problems, I will argue. So we have some experimental distri some distribution that we want to approximate. It turns out that in the particular case of these boson sampling experiments, you can actually calculate the marginal probabilities. So I cannot calculate the probability of a bit streams on the 144 nodes, because that's exponential in 144. Forget it. But if I just take two modes, the marginal distribution on two modes is exponential on two, the number of modes. That doesn't always happen, but it happens in this case, and it happens in other cases as well, that you can actually calculate marginal distributions. So I calculate all the marginal distributions of two modes or three modes. And the interesting thing, this was the idea, uh, what we were able to do. Uh, well, you can, you know, we calculate all the marginals on two modes. And now the question is, how can I sample from a distribution which has the same marginals as the ideal distribution? Because if I get the same marginals, then perhaps I'm approximating the ideal distribution to higher order as well, right? Even though I only use information from the lower marginals. So it turns out that we were able to do this uh, using ideas from Boltzmann machines and sort of mean field theory of Boltzmann machines. Boltzmann machine is another machine learning concept, but um, we made up another algorithm that I'm not going to explain. It's called, we call it a greedy algorithm. But anyway, we found out sort of techniques of how to sample a distribution given the marginals. And when we apply it to this particular experiment, we get things like, well, if we compare the statistical distance between the mock-up and the ideal, and the statistical distance, this is the total variational distance between the experiment and the ideal, not for the full distribution, because that cannot do it, but you know, for 15 modes. So I'm only inform using information of two modes, but I can look at the distribution of um, 15 modes as well. Then it turns out that at least in the marginals of 15 modes, uh, well, negative is good, means the um, mock-up distance to ideal is less than the experimental. That's why they get a negative number. So the mock-up distribution has a much, is much closer to the ideal distribution than the experiment. Okay? And actually, we don't know how close it is because there is a lot of statistical noise. Uh, this is sort of an upper bound. It's at least this close, but you know, it could be here. It's just that we have only like 60 million samples or whatever it is. And then um, you know, it gets super noisy to calculate the marginals in 15 modes. So it's, it's a statistical noise. We cannot actually measure as for, you know, Statistically, it could be, we know it's not ideal, but it's super close. Um, this is just an upper bound. And we actually compare the KL divergence, which is, behaves a bit better. It has less statistical noise. And again, negative is better. We have a KL divergence per mode. Uh, much better with the mock-up than the ideal distribution. 
So the here is you know, a quadratic algorithm. The cost of this approximation is exponential in the order of the modes. So I'm looking only at two modes. So you know, the cost of calculating the distribution of two modes is exponential in two, three modes exponential in three. Um, so it seems to behave quite well. Now, there is this uh, experiment from Canada, from Sanadu, it's a startup in Canada. Uh, this was just published actually a couple of weeks ago. Um, they do Gaussian boson sampling as well, uh, but they do it in a different way. It's more programmable, so you see this looks a bit more a com than a computer because it's not just one crystal. They do some complicated paths with photons so that they end up having a 3D lattice. That's why they have these loops to form like first is one line and then you put it in a plane with sort of these loops so the photons start talking to each other. And then with these loops, you put it in a, plane, in, a, in a cube. So you have a 3D cube of photons that interact with each other. The, the, the cube, the 3D part is the interactions are the same, you know, are given by the 3D cube. And you can sort of change faces and things like that. Um, as part of the manipulation, and here is just how you measure it. So same similar flavor of experiment, also, also Gaussian boson sampling, a bit more programmable, you get a cube. And they compare with a bunch of algorithms. Uh, they look at the cross-entropy, again, sort of the same cross-entropy we look with and on sampling with circuits, and they see that the experiment has higher cross-entropy than our greedy algorithm that I was telling you about. So. Um, so it does better than our algorithm in this experiment. Now, this is our second order greedy algorithm. And I think it's an interesting question. This just came up. But you know, if somebody here would like to sort of work in this question and has fun sort of competing with classical algorithms against the light test <laughs> um, sort of quantum experiments, I have some concrete ideas how to move perhaps the, our lineup, meaning specifically uh, this is comparing only with two mode marginals. Uh, but you know, they, they have a 3D lattice. It has a very particular um, interactions, right? Because not, it's not all to all. It's just neighbors in a 3D lattice. So I think you should try to, if you want to do a classical mock-up, mock -up, then you should look at the marginals given by the 3D lattice. Use that locality. So you can, collect, you can use marginals of higher order and perhaps, you know, I mean, this will go up. This is only second order. We know it goes up with third order. So I don't know. It would be interesting if somebody wants to work on that, because I don't have time, but I would be happy to chat with people about this. <laughs> if somebody wants to take the challenge to try to beat this uh, experiment, then happy to talk to you afterwards. So thank you. Yeah, this is, this is all I have to say. Thank you very much for this nice uh, explanation about uh, what is the power of quantum computers in this sense and what are the limitations currently with, uh, with classical uh, uh, algorithms. So it's, uh, we have time for questions. So if anyone has a question. Hello, and uh, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Uh, I will be working on error correction on these uh, circuits, so my questions are going to be around that. Uh, what kind of error rates are we talking about when you say like fidelity and stuff like that? And the second question is that do you know like what kind of error correction codes are being developed in this, uh, in this area? Yeah, so error rates, well, it depends on the operation, but uh, we're in this experiment, and the experiment doesn't work, the, the, the random circuits doesn't work with error rates much different than these. You need at least 99.5% fidelity for two qubit gates, so 0.5, because you have a lot of two qubit gates. Single qubit gates are around three nines, so 0.9% you know, fidelity, uh, so 0.1% error rate. Um, Measurement is a bit higher. Superconducting qubits are hard to measure. So around 2 3%. Actually, we had like 3%. USDC had like 2% as uh, the improved measurement. So those are more or less the main error rates. And what error correction codes? We are, you know, I saw at the beginning we have like a roadmap to a full tolerant quantum computer. Our, our plan of record is to use the surface code. And the reason why we focus on the surface code is, um, well, one important reason is the surface code is 
is mapped to a surface, and our qubits are in a chip. They're superconducting circuits in a chip, so they also live in a surface. So the surface code can be actually run nicely on a 2D circuit. So that's a very nice property. And on top of that, well, it has a nice threshold. No, we need to get our errors down I, uh, from where they were at least some, you know, three years ago. So that's what we were working on, <laughs> getting the errors down. And, uh, you know, but, but it has a good threshold, so uh, we're not that far. And we have good decoders. So another thing that is hard about quantum error correction, well, you have to decode super quickly because, you know, the, the sort of the clock of your machine um, is going to be limited by the speed at which you decode, right? If you take a long time to decode, then you, your quantum meter has to run slower for the error correction decoder to catch on. So we want to be able to decode in 10 microseconds or something, which is a very hard, also, classical engineering problem. Like, how do you build a decoder, you know, with a latency of 10 microseconds? That's a very hard open question. But we're working on it, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Good questions. Hi, thank you for your talk. This is Jose from uh, Dubai. I teach there. And actually, I have used some of the Google resources uh -huh. for education, like the Great. Cirque interface. Cool. So I wanted to ask you, because these resources are quite amazing. Thank you. And why Google spends so much time and effort and money uh, uh -huh. teaching the secrets <laughs> to <laughs> the rest of the world? <laughs> OK, you. good question. So yeah, um, I will say. One, I think there are like two very hard problems in quantum computing. There are many, but you know, the main <laughs> ones are one is to build a quantum computer that's super hard, but it's also super hard to know what you can use a quantum computer for. So what are the applications of a quantum computer? Uh, so that's a hard problem, you know, because, well, we don't have a quantum computer. So, you know, it's kind of a, again, a catch-22, like it's hard to know. <laughs> what you can do with a quantum computer before you have one. I mean, we have ideas. I, I am very optimistic that we can do a lot. I mean, I know we can do quantum simulation more efficiently than classically, or at least I argue we can. Uh, so that's a, an important application, but we need more applications. It's hard, it's expensive and hard to build a quantum computer. It would be a pity if we actually build it and then with applications are not ready. So one way to try to, you know, promote, <laughs> right, try to, improve that situation because, you know, we're, we're not a super big group. I mean, we're not a small, but a lot of our effort is in actually building the quantum computer, and that's already hard. We do have, a, you know, a nice group on applications, but our thinking is, well, let's try to empower, you know, everybody, right, to look for applications because whoever finds an application is going to be great for us. <laughs> we want applications for a quantum computer. So that's one reason why we you know, open source everything and, and we give everything away in terms of applications. And I guess, generally speaking, you know, it's good for, anyway, uh, social, whatever you want, feedback. I don't know. You know it's, it's good. It's good to, <laughs> to also try to work on education. Uh, we, you know, we also need quantum engineers eventually, right? There aren't that many. We need to form the, the, I mean, there are many other reasons as well, but I think the main one, the selfish one is we need applications if you want. There are many other reasons why it's good to, you know, invest in education nevertheless. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Alvan Artur, for, for organizing and hosting. It was a splendid talk. It was actually thank you. enlightening. Yeah? Thank so you. here's a candid question. Uh, so irrespective of the technology you use for, the, uh, for hosting the qubits in your chips, uh, it seems that there is agreement that there's a limit on the number of qubits in a single chip. Yes. And we start to see architectural solutions to address the grand challenge of scalability, like disaggregated architectures, quote, uh, many, co many quantum computing core architectures. Uh -huh. So even IBM disclosed recently, two weeks ago, they wrote roadmap, sorry to talk about your competitors, sure. uh, talking about using quantum coherent links to communicate among and across the cores. You see in what, sorry? Using uh, quantum coherent communication okay. links across like the cores. Optical or, okay. or other approaches, right? Okay. So what's your take on that type of uh, distributed architectures? And if ever, how would that affect the way you envision your algorithms? How do you partition them? How uh, would that affect the, the algorithm architecture call design? Right, yeah, good question. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, indeed, there is a limit 
Right, like if I go to the image at the beginning, well, it might take a while, but just for illustration. <laughs> uh, oh, here it is. So this is what we want to build, right? So this gives you sort of the, I mean, all this stuff around here, those are like my FPGA or whatever the, the you know, the, the rack programming the thing. Right now it's like one rack, right? Because we have like 50 whatever qubits. Once you have like a million physical qubits, well, it's not a rack anymore. You have all this stuff for the control. Uh, but and then you have a very large delusion fritz, and then all the thing in the middle, those are my qubits. That's like not one chip, clearly, right? That's the scale of one person. We're not going to micro, you know, fabricate a chip which is whatever meters long. So yeah, and therefore you cannot put all the qubits that you need in the same chip. So uh, chips need to communicate, and it needs to be coherent because if it's not coherent, then you don't get a quantum computer. You get many small quantum computers, and you don't get one large quantum computer. So for sure, you need quantum communication, coherent communication. Now the question is, you know, what is the quantum communication that is more realistic? Well, in our view, you just uh, these are you know superconducting systems. You just smash them together, and you get a very large supercomputer, superconducting plane. You just, there are different chips, but you smash them together and make a superconducting bond between multiple chips. So that's really coherent. Yeah, I mean, of course it's hard, but there are many other hard things as well. But anyway, uh, it, you know, our chips already use band bonding, right? Where you have some superconducting elements on the top chip and some superconducting elements on the bottom chip, and these two chips, they just are squashed together with band bonds, and they're superconducting and coherent. So similar principles. We're not the only ones doing band bonding. If you know, if there are solutions that somebody works out, that's great. But but that you know, it's super hard. People talk about going from you know going to photons because photons are super good at moving around because they don't interact with the stuff and you can put them on optical fiber. But precisely because they don't interact too much with anything, I mean, it's, it's, it's then it's, it's very hard to get high fidelity transduction from whatever superconducting qubit or ions or whatever you have to photons. And we need high fidelity everywhere, including in that link, so that's our plan for now. And that's why this is one fridge. It has to be one fridge in our plan. Any other question? Uh, hello. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Uh, first, because I work on that. <laughs> but um, I have a question about, um, so these quantum advantage, quantum supremacy, whatever experiments. Yeah. Uh, I think they are useful and really nice to see, but I don't see the real application mm -hmm. beyond that demonstration that quantum computers are more powerful in some sense. Uh -huh. But have you, has there been uh, proof any quantum advantage today uh, for some real application? Like some weeks ago, there was a new paper that was quantum advantage on learning. I think it was from Google, maybe. What am I doing? Some machine learning? I think it was on learning. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, we probably something like yeah, that. Maybe. A few yeah, weeks ago it came out, yeah, on nature. Yeah, yeah. So in the end, is, have you seen any quantum advantage already uh -huh. uh, in some real application apart from quantum real like random circuits? Random circuits, or yeah. Or perhaps was on sampling. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, no. So <laughs> <laughs> no. But so, you know, quantum advantage is kind of a loaded term. That's why I prefer to talk about beyond classical or something. So in our paper, when we say quantum advantage, it means we saw that there is an exponential speed up, uh, what we call beyond classical, because, you know, in that case, like, you actually have to load the data, basically. Hmm. Uh, so you know what you're doing. So, you know, it's like a, one of these weird, like, imagine, you know, I don't know <laughs> what the data was, right? And I only have this access. Then it's exponentially faster. But the reality is I have to program it. And when you program it, then you, you know what you're programming. So then it's not, you know. So it's kind of an oracle speed up, but it's not like a real speed up. Okay. Uh, but still, it's a quantum advantage in the sense that it's an exponential speed up on the oracle model, if you want. Like, if you're not allowed to look at the actual control. Uh, so yeah. I. No, there are no, yeah. The, the other question is maybe this, um, these random circuits can have applications. Uh, perhaps so another proposal from Scott, who also proposed was on sampling, is using for certified randomness, which have been exploring that. I, I'm not 
fully convinced that there is an advantage there, but anyway, it's certainly worth talking about, and perhaps with some work, we might make that an application. And there are things related. We haven't really got an advantage, but we study auto, it's called, well, it's about how information moves around in quantum systems, uh, which is related to quantum gravity. And we do not have a quantum advantage there, but if we lower our error rates by a factor of two, which we need to anyway, then arguably we can enter, you know, for measuring information scrambling in quantum circuits, which are random circuits, how information moves around in random circuits, which are in some sense a model for black holes, I understand. We might enter a regime where some properties of information scrambling can only be measured experimentally, but we haven't got there yet. There are also experiments, depending on what you, I mean, in terms of physics, there are, you know, there are things that look more and more experiments and then less computing, and a few of them, you know, the, 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 like when you actually go and then try to see if you can simulate the experiment, a few of them might be unable to simulate them, but then try all of them. So it's possible that, you know, in other things like fermionic lattices, which I, I haven't worked on simulating that. Uh, I look into optical lattices and I was, I've been able to sort of, well, me, my colleagues and I, or, We've been able to simulate some experiments there. But, you know, it's like the thing with Gaussian Boson sampling. It also, or actually with tensor networks, you know. Once the proposal is out there and you actually work on it, you might be able to come up with approximations and stuff like that. So you have to be a bit careful. Thank you. I only had a little question about the last plot you show. Uh, the one talking about ent cross entropy. I, I wanted to know just, Is maybe I'm, I'm not smart enough to get that, uh, what, what implies having a higher level of cross entropy? What, what is this for? And, and this kind of things, because I don't know anything about it. So. Yeah, uh, um, well, what it basically means, higher cross entropy means you're closer to the correct distribution. Uh -huh. That's what it means. Now, why? Why well, is this? Why is this yeah, even that takes a little bit <laughs> longer okay. to explain. Uh, if you are like in machine learning and statistical physics, uh, a measure that is used there is the KL divergence, which has two terms, the cross entropy and the entropy. Uh, so here, because the difference is coming from noise, that also has high entropy. So if we assume that we have high entropy, the cross entropy works well as a measure of distance. So if you are familiar with KL divergence, it's related to the KL divergence, assuming that you have high entropy. But bottom line, in this particular plot, high cross entropy means closer to ideal. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank and it's kind of used in machine learning as well. You know, like to, you train machine learning algorithms trying to get good cross entropy. It's kind of a likelihood ratio. You can get the cross entropy from the log of a likelihood ratio. Any other question? Hello, thanks for the talk. I have a more of a general question. So in terms of, uh, well, the overall problem of building a, a quantum computer, and more specifically also reducing the error rates and all of this, how much of it is an engineering problem and how much of it is a theoretical problem, some physics that we don't know or something like that? And if it is a theoretical problem, if eventually it's possible to simulate some physics into a quantum computing, how likely it is that you can get new breakthroughs in quantum computing by simulating physics, so advancing uh -huh. in the field within the same field, kind of. Yeah, I that's guess. a good question. And actually, yeah, some people like John Preskill, who is a famous Caltech professor, has been saying for a while that probably the first application for quantum computer is going to be to design a quantum computer, as, as you're pointing out. That might be the first application. Uh, so it's both. It's, there is certainly you know, a lot of engineering, as you can tell from the complication of like, this scale that we're working on now. Uh, it takes a lot of engineering to, and a lot of control, and a lot of software, and a lot of stuff to get this to work well, to scale it. But there is a lot of theoretical work as well. We have the qubits that we have, and the, the error rates are still too high. We need to lower the error rates. And in part, that's engineering, like cleaning surfaces or better materials or things like that. But I think you know, it, it, there's a lot of theory as well um, having to do with I don't know, different designs of superconducting qubits 
And it's quite possible that people come up with a completely different qubit proposal that works better than superconducting qubits. I think right now superconducting qubits are sort of the forefront. It's quite possible that somebody improves the design of the super, well, we have to improve the design <laughs> of the superconducting qubits for sure. So that's a lot of theory goes into that. And there might be like very drastic, you know, redesigns that look at very different superconducting qubits and perhaps different flavors of qubits. So there's a lot of work in that direction. There's a lot of overhead in the plan of record in error correction. We, if we lower the rates drastically, there will be a lot less overhead. So it's both, yeah. Improving the design, improving, I'm sorry, yeah, improving the design, like, you know, lowering their rates, yeah, most, mostly it's about lowering their rates. Any other question? Uh, hello again. I just want to know if there is, if Google has a um, estimation or projection of how big uh, the market is going to be for quantum computing in terms of like US dollars or something. No. Nothing? <laughs> okay. I'm guessing it's internal. No, we don't, no, we, I don't have an estimation actually. Um, but, you know, I am optimistic and I can argue why, you know, I, I mean, Okay, my story that I would say is that um, you know quantum physics is physics, all physics, most physics, almost all. Um, just we can only simulate a small part of quantum physics, and that gave us already semiconductors, and semiconductors are quite important. You know, so I think that if we can simulate stuff outside of mean field, which is kind of the only thing we can sort of simulate today, there will you know eventually be a, there will be you know potential new technologies the equivalent of a semiconductor, which we didn't know when we came up with, well, people came up with quantum physics, eventually you get semiconductors. So I think it's gonna be, it's gonna have that kind of impact because when you invent a new computational capability, it tends to have a high impact. And we have a kind of a good handle, like in simulations in chemistry, there are pretty well advanced algorithms with good error source estimates that I will argue do things that you cannot do classically with a full time quantum computer, even though once we are able to run it, then they're gonna be even faster because we are gonna be able to do heuristics. We're comparing like mathematical proofs of quantum algorithms against classical heuristics, so that's hard, it's, it's unfair. Um, but you know, it's also true that I think we're missing applications and that's also, uh, you know, as I was saying, like why we open source so much stuff. I think we need more applications as well. Uh, so what is the market size? I'm not an economist, so I don't know. But I think, you know, it will grow with time as everything else. And I think potentially huge, like semiconductors today. But how long? I don't know. So maybe I have a last question. <laughs> so you just show um, a lot of effort, a lot of theory, but also experimental effort. And in the end, in your opinion, how important is it to theoreticians to know more about this kind of experiments and the other way around? And if mm -hmm. you believe that at the moment quantum computing is, is uh, all experimental and theoretical efforts are quite joint efforts, do you think that that will last uh, a lot of time? Or at some point, both communities will start to, to, know, to, to separate each other? Or do you think that for a theoretician it's important to know more about the experimental uh, limitations maybe or, or advances? Well, there are many kinds of theoreticians, but uh, it happens, and it, hap you know, it happens like at Google, but you know, it happens like when people get access to this kind of experimental NIST devices, which are pretty amazing devices as a physics experiment. It happens that people come up, you know, th hardcore theories come up with interesting new ideas, and not just, you know, People interested in designing superconducting qubits, of course, they have to know, you know, a lot about the noise and, and and stuff like that because that's what they're working on. But people like theories working on applications, they, uh, you know, I, I didn't talk about the applications we're doing, but recently we did like a time crystal experiment, which was proposed by people in condensed matter community, not by us, and they were very happy that we could run it. I th I think they were inspiring part, but. I mean, they certainly did a couple of papers. Time crystals were not initially thought of something you would run on a quantum computer, but eventually they decided, oh, we can you know, probably implement this in a quantum computer. And they published some interesting papers about that. Uh, in our own group, we have Igor Alainer, who's a pretty well-known condensed matter physicist. 
Uh, he recently published a paper, a theoretical paper on bound states of photons, an analytical solution for bound states. And the only reason why he was working on that is because, you know, he wants he wants our group to then implement the, the experiment, and and it's pretty cool, you know, like like you can actually propose something, and then you can see it realize um, in a few months, perhaps. So. It, it changes your way of thinking. You you know you work in, in in other questions as well. So it certainly does have an influence. I mean, there are of course theories that you know they work on other things, right? Maybe quantum gravity or whatever string theory. I don't know. I mean, there are many kinds of theories, but but there are certainly people that once you get access, they kind of influence the way of working, and you come up with interesting things for sure. Okay, let's thank the the speaker again. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>